All right. Hopefully that's enough time to chat. Um, if we could come back this way, that'd be great. Thank you. Yay. All right. Good morning, everybody. Uh, if we haven't met, hi, I'm Marissa Slaney. I'm married to Caleb. Um, during the week, I'm a primary school teacher, so I was doing everything I could not to do, like a call and response to get your attention then. I was just being like, be calm, be calm. <laughs> uh, so thank you for not singing back to me as I got your attention. Um, yeah, and this morning, uh, we're going to be talking about Romans 15. There's quite a lot in the chapter, a whole lot of different ideas, so we'll read it as we go through. Um, and yeah, but it's continuing on from um, what Greg talked about last week. But to begin, we're going to start with a story. Um, it's about a guy called Jacob de Chaser. Uh, he was raised in America in a Christian family. Um, and so he went to school. Through his time at school, he got quite a hard time about his faith. And by the time he left school, he was no longer a Christian. He decided that it wasn't for him. Um, and then he joined the American army. And during this time, the Japanese uh, bombed Pearl Harbor and killed 2,000 Americans. And at this point, Jacob really wanted revenge. He was, like, quite committed to that. And so he volunteered to be part of a team of 80 men who went on a secret mission to strike back at Japan. And it was known as the Dude Little Raid. Um, and Jacob's part in this was to be the captain of a team of eight people. And they were bombing the city of Nagoya. Um, and during their mission, they dropped multiple bombs, and he intentionally then shot as many people as possible to really seek out that revenge. It was quite, he was very motivated about that. Um, but unfortunately for Jacob and his team, they somehow ran out of fuel quite unexpectedly while they were still in Japanese territory. And so they had to parachute down into Japan in the dark, and then all of their team were captured. And so three of their team were executed on the spot, and then the other five were taken into captivity, um, including Jacob. And it was quite awful, uh, their conditions. One of the people in the team died from starvation and the torture. Um, and during this, Jacob's hatred towards the Japanese people grew even more. He was quoted saying, my hatred for them nearly drove me crazy. And this time, the only peace that he could find from those feelings of just rage um, was actually when he quoted scriptures, scriptures that he'd learnt from his parents as a kid. And so for months, he kept asking the guards for a Bible, and eventually, two years into his imprisonment, he was given one. Um, and at this point, his life totally changed. He read the Bible cover to cover, and his hatred was actually replaced with love for the Japanese people, um, so much so that he actually ended up sharing the gospel with his prison mates, with the guards, and even the people that had been torturing him. Um, and one year and three months after his conversion, and 40 months after he was imprisoned, he and the other three surviving prisoners were rescued. So they were taken back to America, and soon after getting there, he actually studied theology, um, and then he returned to Japan to share the gospel um, with the people that he had previously despised the most. And so seeing someone who'd been an American soldier, who'd bombed people, who'd been a war prisoner, and then choosing to return to Japan um, actually really spoke to the Japanese people. And thousands of them came to know Jesus um, through his preaching and his time there. And actually at the same time, there was a guy called Mitsuo Fuchida, I think. Um, and he heard the gospel and became a Christian. And he had um, actually been the commander who had led the Pearl Harbor bombing raid, so on the other side of that war, um, and he had been struggling with the rage and the guilt from his wartime involvement. And so when he accepted Jesus, he was forgiven from that and set free. Um, and Jacob and Mitsuo actually then ended up preaching side by side. So the captain of the Doodle Raid and the commander of the Pearl Harbor bombing um, then stood together and preached the good news of Jesus. Um, and over the years, actually, Jacob built churches in Japan, um, including one in Nagoya, which was the city that he had bombed earlier. Um, and so that just blows my mind, that kind of intense hatred that two people can have, but then through the Holy Spirit, they can actually then stand united to then share about Jesus um, and that their lives can just be completely changed. And so that's the kind of unity we're going to hear about today. That's our main focus of chapter 15. Um, and it's where God intervenes in these situations that seem impossible. 
where it's like, how could there ever be peace in these two places? And that's where God steps in. Um, And it's pretty clear when we look around the world today that that kind of unity is needed. There's so much division over different views on politics, gender, race, um, choices that people have or what's said to one another, or even just if you think pineapple should go on a pizza. Like, we're divided over everything. Um, And it's actually quite similar for the Roman church, which is what we're looking at. Um, And as Greg shared last week, the Roman church um, were quite a mix of Jewish Christians and Gentiles, the non-Jewish Christians. And they were particularly divided in their church because um, Emperor Claudius had declared that all the Jews needed to leave uh, Rome and then they could return five years later. And so during that time, the Gentile members of the church um, carried on believing in Jesus but they didn't necessarily celebrate the Sabbath day or eat kosher meat, which some of those Jewish Christians thought was really important. So when those Jewish Christians came back into the church, there was discussion about that, and there was division um, in their group. So those kind of caused what um, Greg called secondary issues last week. They're the issues in the church that have two or more possibly correct options. And that's what Paul is continuing to talk about at the start of chapter 15 today um, in verses 1 to 4. Um, So we're going to read from the New Living Translation today, and Karen's going to read it for us. So read along if you'd like. We who are strong must be considerate of those who are sensitive about things like this. We must not just please ourselves. We should help others do what is right and build them up in the Lord. For even Christ didn't live to please himself. As the scriptures say, the insults of those who insult you, O God, have fallen on me. Such things were written in the scriptures long ago to teach us, and the scriptures give us hope and encouragement as we wait patiently for God's promises to be fulfilled. Cool. Thanks, Karen. Um, So in these verses, Paul is encouraging the Roman church to put others first, uh, to not just please themselves So for those believers that believed that it was really important to celebrate the Sabbath day and that they were honoring God through doing that, um, he's challenging the other believers to be considerate of that. Um, And then in our day day and age, it could be issues over how we dress at church. It could be the order of the service um, at church. It's things that aren't quite as clear cut. And so if other people are believing that doing that is honoring God, then we're to be considerate of that um, in those things. And it goes wider than just church issues. Um, We're called to help others and to build them up. Um, And the example in there is that Jesus put everything aside, that he didn't just live live to please himself. He actually died on the cross for us. Um, And so without his death, we couldn't be made right with Christ. Um, And so it's quite a challenge because it's saying, okay, be considerate of others, and here's the example of Jesus. And that's quite a high standard. And so I think, I don't know, for me, I go, that's impossible. Like, I, can't, I can't be that selfless, you know. We're busy, we're rushing around. How could I be so selfless like Jesus? But that's where the good news comes. The next verse talks about the Holy Spirit. And so it's through the Holy Spirit that we can do that. So let's read verses 5 and 6 together. May God, who gives this patience and encouragement, help you live in complete harmony with each other as is fitting for followers of Christ Jesus. Then all of you can join together with one voice, giving praise and glory to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Cool. So luckily it's through God and through the Holy Spirit that we're actually enabled to love, God, uh, love others, I guess as well as love God, but love others and put them first and be considerate of them. Um, and in verse 5 it says, complete harmony so that we can praise God and give him glory. And that's the purpose of all of this, so that we could actually live in a way um, that points people to Jesus, that in the middle of division, we can stand together, we could be united um, and have the Holy Spirit working through us to bring unity again. Um, And I actually remember Jeanette Brown said something that stuck with me one time, and it was that I can't love people very well, but the Holy Spirit in me can. And that's the thing, it's that Holy Spirit that works out through us, that empowers us to show the fruits of the Holy Spirit, um, that we can then put others first and be unified with people that we find division with. Um, but that can be quite a hard concept to get our heads around. I think it's, it sometimes sounds like a nice idea to say, okay, well, in the middle of division, when there's all these big feelings, big emotions, just rely on the Holy Spirit. Um, but 
There's a really great story from Corrie ten Boom, and hopefully the video will work. Oh, um, where there's an example of this. If you're watching from home, it might not work, but if you Google Corrie ten Boom forgiveness story, you can watch along with us. <laughs> it was some time ago that I was in Berlin. And there came a man to me and said, Ah, Mr. Boom, I am glad to see you. Don't you know me? And suddenly I saw that man that was one of the most cruel aufseers, guards, in the concentra in concentration camp. And that man said, I have, I'm now a Christian. I have found the Lord Jesus. I read my Bible and I know that there is forgiveness for all the sins of the whole world, also for my sins. I have forgiveness for the cruelties I have done. But then I have asked God grace for an opportunity that I could ask one of my very victims forgiveness. And Fräulein Tambom wants him here forgiven. Will you forgive me? And I could not. I remembered the suffering of my dying sister through him. But I was not able, I could not, I could only hate him. And then I took one of these Beautiful text, one of these boundless resources, Romans 5.5. 5. The love of God is shed abroad into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who is given to us. And I said, thank you, Jesus, that you have brought into my heart God's love through the Holy Spirit who is given to me. And thank you, Father, that your love is stronger than my hatred and unforgiveness. That same moment, I was free. And I could say, brother, give me your hand. And I shook hands with him. And it was as if I felt God's love stream through my arms. You never touch so the ocean of God's love as that you forgive your enemies. I just think it's such an encouraging story. Like, it's just phenomenal that when Cory was faced with a situation uh, where now a fellow believer had asked for her forgiveness, and she went, I actually don't think I can do that. And I can, I can understand where she's coming from. Like, if you'd gone through all of that and you've seen your sister suffering, you've felt it, and then if someone's saying, hey, can you just forgive me for all of that? That's huge. But to see that, for her, the reality of the Holy Spirit was in that moment, that she could then pray through the Holy Spirit. She was then filled with that love for her fellow brother um, to offer that forgiveness. And the encouraging thing is that Holy Spirit is available for all of us. When we choose to know Jesus um, and to accept his love for us, we can then be filled with the Holy Spirit. And that's actually what the next verses are talking about uh, in verses 7 to 12. So we'll read those together. Therefore, accept each other just as Christ has accepted you, so that God will be given glory. Remember that Christ came as a servant to the Jews to show that God is true to the promises he made to their ancestors. He also came so that the Gentiles might give glory to God for his mercies to them. That is what the psalmist wrote, meant when he wrote, For this I will praise you among the Gentiles. I will sing praises to your name. And in another place it is written, Rejoice with his people, you Gentiles. And yet again, praise the Lord, all you Gentiles. Praise him, all you people of the earth. And in another place, Isaiah said, The heir to David's throne will come, and he will rule over the Gentiles. They will place their hope on him. Thank you. Um, so you might have heard the word Gentiles quite a lot in that. So those were... Uh, the people that weren't Jews. And so through these verses, Paul's really highlighting that all of us are called to be in God's family. And it wasn't an afterthought. He's mentioned um, three key parts of the Old Testament, the writings, the prophecies, and the... Oh, there's another one. Three key parts of it, though. Um, oh, I had it. Oh, well, that's all right. Three key parts of the Old Testament. Um, just to be like, hey... This is God's plan from the beginning. 
It's not an afterthought that some of us are in God's family and then others join. It's not like God's only like, oh, let's just bring you in. From the beginning, God had the purpose that we could all come to know him. He has thought of each of us and designed us with a purpose and with enthusiasm, and he delights in us. Um, and that's true for all of um, humanity, that God created each of us. And so he wants us to be in that relationship with him. He wants us to know him. Um, and so then he offers us all that free, giveness, uh, free gift of forgiveness, that we can choose to believe in Jesus, to believe that he has died for us, that he's died for our sins, and that he is now living in our lives through his holy in our lives through the Holy Spirit, um, and so if we choose to follow Jesus, that changes everything. Like we talked about before, we don't have to try and find unity with others on our own. It's not in our own strength, but instead the Holy Spirit is at work in our hearts, changing us and restoring unity with others. And so I really love verse thirteen. Um, we'll read that one together now too. I pray that God, the source of hope will fill you completely with joy and peace because you trust in him. Then you will overflow with confidence, hope through the power of the Holy Spirit. Thank you. Okay. So this verse and the mention of the Holy Spirit reminds me a little bit of the science experiment. So bear with me. I'm not a scientist, but I'm a primary school teacher, so I get a bit excited about this. Uh, I tested it yesterday, and it worked. If it doesn't, we'll just move on. Um, But... In this glass, there is water, nothing magic, just normal water. Um, This one's going to represent us. So I'm going to pour it in our container. Sorry, it is very small, but this amount of liquid is going to take 20 eggs, and I already spent a long time cracking all the eggs, so bear with me. Um, And so that water is us. This one is oil, and so that's going to go in the cup as well. Oil is all the people that we have disunity with, uh, that we don't feel um, unified, that we have disagreements with, and if you can see, the water and the oil are very separate, or as you've probably discovered in cooking along the way. Um, It's really hard to unify those, and so we can try. We can uh, maybe begrudgingly put others first. We could uh, maybe pretend to love others, and for a quick second, It looks like that worked. It looks like there's some unity, but it actually hasn't restored the brokenness. They still separate out again. And so that's where we need the Holy Spirit to bring that true unity. So emulsifiers, apparently, I've learned. Um, In this case, we've got egg yolks. I'm not sure how I'm going to pour from this, but we'll go with it. So, emulsifiers are things that bring together two liquids that aren't usually compatible. They have, apparently, a hydrophilic head, which draws in the water, and a hydrophobic tail, apparently, which draws in the oil. And so, they bring these two incompatible liquids together. And so the Holy Spirit, when it's at work in our lives, in these moments of disunity between us and another, very separate, through the Holy Spirit, like in Corrie ten Boom's story, can bring us together. Fingers crossed. we can then be unified. There is no longer division. (laughs) Boy, that's a relief. Um, (laughs) If it's separating out, I just haven't stirred it enough, that's all. But we'll just pretend totally fixed. It's all fine. Um, So that kind of picture of this unity reminds me a little bit of Jesus. Those It's talking about having a hydrophilic and hydrophobic tail and head. It's kind of like one side's grabbing onto the oil, one side's grabbing onto the water. And that reminds me a little bit of actually the picture of Jesus on the cross. He's got his arms stretched out. And on one side, he's grabbing us and he's uniting us on the other side with God the Father. That we have 
had our sins forgiven as he has died in our place and we receive his righteousness. God the Father now sees us as righteous because of what Jesus has done and Jesus has brought the impossible and made it possible because there is no way that we could do that on our own. We could never be perfect enough to meet God's standard, but Jesus has died in our place. He has stretched out, he's grabbed us on one arm and God the Father on the other arm and brought us together. He has unified us. And it's the same in moments with other people. When we can't find unity, he's grabbing us and he's grabbing the other person and the Holy Spirit is at work in that, unifying those two. And so um, God who can bring, so we believe in a God who can bring anybody together. And it might seem impossible, like the oil and the water mixing, but like the story earlier where God brought together Jacob and Mitsuo, who previously had been sworn enemies, but through the Holy Spirit they were united and they were able to preach side by side. Or like Corrie ten Boom and the prison guard who had done horrific things, who could then be united through the Holy Spirit. Um, and that's the God we believe in, the Holy Spirit that can be at work in our lives and enables the po- impossible to be possible. And so, like that verse is saying, it's not only the Holy Spirit that brings unity. The Holy Spirit also brings us complete joy and complete peace. And so how could we not want that in our lives? How could we not choose to follow Jesus and accept him in our lives so that we could receive that Holy Spirit who is with us in all of these moments, in the joyful moments, but also in these really hard moments when we're not unified with others? And then... How could we not want that for other people? How could we not want them to have this complete joy and complete peace and hope that overflows? And so I think that's where Paul's coming from, because if we keep reading, um, he talks a bit about his purpose and his hope that others would come to know Jesus. So we'll read on from verses 14 to 22. I am fully convinced, my dear brothers and sisters, that you are full of goodness You know these things so well, you can teach each other all about them. Even so, I have been bold enough to write about some of these points, knowing that all you need is this reminder. For by God's grace, I am a special messenger from Christ Jesus to you Gentiles. I bring you the good news so that I might present you as an acceptable offering to God, made holy by the Holy Spirit. So I have reason to be enthusiastic about all Christ Jesus has done through me in my service to God. Yet I dare not boast about anything except what Christ has done through me, bringing the Gentiles to God by my message and by the way I worked among them. They were fully convinced by the power of miraculous signs and wonders and by the power of God's Spirit. In this way, I have fully presented the good news of Christ from Jerusalem all the way to Illyricum. My ambition has always been to preach the good news where the name of Christ has never been heard, rather than where a church has already been started by someone else. I've been following the plan spoken of in the scriptures where it says, those who have never been told about him will see, and those who have never heard of him will understand. In fact, my visit to you has been delayed so long because, of, because I have been preaching in these places. Thank you. All right, so now our purpose won't look the same as Paul's. He was really passionate about sharing the gospel with the Gentiles who had never heard the gospel before, um, and that's what he dedicated his later part of his life to. Um, He preached to them, he wrote letters to them, he went and met with them um, so that they would know too that they are called into God's family and that God delights in them. Um, So our purpose will be a bit different to that. I don't imagine we're all going out and planting churches, but some of us might be. But our key purpose as Christians should actually be that others come to know Jesus. And that might look different in different contexts. For example, um, if you are a student, you might live in a way that shows your self-control and your joy um, and your studying so that then you might, through the Holy Spirit, be able to unite others with God. Um, If you're a stay-at-home parent, then maybe you could try having conversations about God with your kids um, or talking about what God is teaching you and model the Holy Spirit working through you in the way that you live so that your kids could be united with God. Um, If you're working, maybe this looks like working with integrity and peace in a way that points others to Jesus. Talk about going to church or talk about what God has done for you so that your workmates can be united with God. 
Um, and if you're retired, this might be talking about the peace that the Holy Spirit gives you um, or the faithfulness of God that you have seen over the years. And for me, I know that the stories of my grandparents actually really impacted my faith, hearing of that faithfulness. So be encouraged as you share those stories that you might be able to unite others with God through that. Um, and so that's really exciting that we get this privilege to work alongside God through his Holy Spirit to unite others um, with him. And so then we just need to keep in mind, how can we be doing that each day in all our different contexts? What is it that we're doing that we can intentionally be pointing others to Jesus? Um, But yeah, now we come to the end of the chapter, and it's Paul talking about his travel plans and a gift for a church. Um, So we're going to read verses 23 to 33 together. But now I have finished my work in these regions, and after all these long years of waiting, I'm eager to visit you. I'm planning to go to Spain, and when I do, I will stop off in Rome. And after I've enjoyed your fellowship for a little while, you can provide for my journey. But before I come, I must go to Jerusalem to take a gift to the believers there. For you see, the believers in Macedonia and Achaia have eagerly taken up an offering for the poor among the believers in Jerusalem. They were glad to do this because they feel they owe a real debt to them. Since the Gentiles received the spiritual blessings of the good news from the believers in Jerusalem, they feel the least they can do in return is to help them financially. As soon as I've delivered this money and completed their good deed of theirs, I will come to see you on my way to Spain. And I'm sure that when I come, Christ will richly bless our time together. Dear brothers and sisters, I urge you in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to join in my struggle by praying to God for me. Do this because of your love for me, given to you by the Holy Spirit. Pray that I'll be rescued from those in Judea who refuse to obey God. Pray also that the believers there will be willing to accept the donation I'm taking to Jerusalem. Then, by the will of God, I'll be able to come to you with a joyful heart, and we will be an encouragement to each other. And now may God, who gives us his peace, be with you all. Amen. Thank you. Thanks for all your reading, Karen. That's a long chapter. Um, Cool. So as you can see, once again, it actually kind of links back to the start of our chapter where Paul's being considerate of others. He's taking a gift from a Gentile church to a Jewish church to try and bring unity between those two places, to remind them that we are all part of God's church um, and that we're united through Jesus. Um, So now that we've made it to the end of the chapter, some things to ponder Um, So the big question is, where do you need the Holy Spirit to bring unity? Is it unity between you and God? Is it that you need the Holy Spirit to be kind of the mediator between that, bringing you and God to know each other? Is it that you've, maybe you need to choose to believe in God for the first time today? That you're saying, Jesus, I trust that you've died for my sins and I am giving my life to you. Will you bring me into unity between um, myself and God? Maybe it's that you need unity between you and somebody else. Maybe there's some division um, going on in a certain situation in your life. Is it that that you need God to intervene in and to bring unity in impossible situations like Corrie ten Boom and that um, prison guard or like Jacob and Mitsuo? Situations that seem impossible. We could go, I could never be united with that person or they could never bring unity into that situation. Is it that that actually you need to be praying for the Holy Spirit to be at work in? Um, Or the last one is, like Paul, is there somebody on your heart that you could help bring into unity with God? That you go, hmm, they really need to know God's hope and joy and peace. They need to have that overflowing in their life. And how could you bring that unity to them as they meet with God and come to know him? So I'm just going to pray, and then we'll just have some time to just sit and speak with God. Uh, Pray, what is it that God is prompting you to uh, do following this? And then the worship team will get up. So let's pray together. Thank you, Jesus, that you came and you died for us, that you saved us from our sins and that you sent the Holy Spirit. I thank you um, that you delight in us and that you're in each day with us, that in those really tricky moments that you fill us with your spirit and you empower us to be unified with others, that you give us the hope and the joy and the peace that we need for each day. Um, I thank you for the hope of eternity and all that is to come. And I pray that you give us wisdom as we think about how we can be unified with you or unified with others today. Would you speak to us 
um, and be at work in our hearts and our lives. In Jesus' name, amen.